In July of 1969, they set out. Deluded or bold or perhaps both going out into the wilderness, across the Everglades, on the Tamiami Trail, in a blue 1968 Pontiac Catalina station wagon. They missed the memo from Jesus saying, take nothing for the journey. For starters, three kids and a baby. In the back seat, yours truly, and the baby, my sister. In the way back, no seatbelts. In the way back, my brothers and the baggage. Sandals for tossing and a staff to reach those boys in the way back might have been handy for controlling unruly passengers, but they were not necessary. You see, Daddy's mustache had miraculous crowd control capability. It came with several bristle settings a kind of check engine warning light to alert us any time he thought things were getting overheated. So miraculous was the power of this bristle mustache alert meter that from the back seat we could sense it, even though he was keeping his eyes on the road. Behind us on a trailer, a 25-foot boat. Behind us in the boat, the gear. Two lists for that gear. For the fishermen, everything you might need. Fishing rods, bait buckets, casting nets, tackle boxes filled with lures your dumb older sister thought were cute but were completely useless for fishing. List number two for the sand and surf aficionados, towels and rafts and our awesome roll-up bamboo beach mats. And of course, we cannot forget, also in that boat was the epic marmot pram, all the way from the old country, deep navy blue, white stripes, big white wheels, leather strap suspension, and a very cushy interior. My sister in that pram with the mosquito net was the only one on the entire island of Captiva who was not on the mosquito buffet. Not so for the rest of us. Going out, we ran to the beach. And after every wonderful day, when it's time to go, it's time to go. Time to shake off, and as my grandmother would say, leave the beach at the beach. And coming in, lest we become hors d'oeuvres to the mosquitoes, we ran back to the cabin. A lot of going, a lot of coming, a lot of gear, and wonderful memories. And it truly is wonderful this summer to hear the excitement that so many of you are going out and going places, creating memories, and the joy of hearing the stories when you come home. And so it seems that throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is always coming and going. And we see it again this morning. Jesus is going out and about among the villages teaching. And Jesus had many followers, but he called the 12 disciples to come along with him, disciples to learn from him. And interestingly, when he did that, he called them in pairs. Two by two, they followed Simon and Andrew, James and John. But you see, being with Jesus is not a spectator sport. And so Jesus begins to send them out. And just like when he called them, he sends them out two by two, going out to unknown trails. What to pack? What to pack? My friends, when Jesus says travel light, take only the essentials, he means it. Gives them two lists each starting with one TSA-approved item. List number one, the gear. you got to have the gear, right? A staff is okay, but no food, no carry-on, and no cash or credit cards. List number two, wardrobe. Sandals, check, but no change of clothes. I couldn't travel like that. But this is not the first time the disciples have left everything behind. 
The fishermen left their nets and their boats and their relatives to follow Jesus. And now they're going out two by two. Sent out by Jesus, the carpenter, the construction worker, traveling without food or money or a change of clothes. They can take two things. Great. That will let them walk the road. But what will sustain them on the journey? Apparently, the hospitality of the people who welcome them. But they're not exactly sent out by a VIP, and they're hardly celebrity guests. What will sustain them is the kind of ancient hospitality that meant treating strangers like honored guests. Jesus challenges them to learn to live the gospel. He's sending them out to teach. Go to the first home that welcomes you and stay. No asking for an upgrade. That's important because you see a home is a place to have a conversation. In this world, a safe place to have a conversation where they can speak freely about the amazing, shocking news they have to share. Because remember, this is dangerous, difficult, and risky business. When Jesus came home to Nazareth, he met with scorn and rejection. And Jesus knows that more often than not, his disciples will get the same reception. There will be folks who refuse to welcome them, who reject what Jesus has sent them to share, and worse. But now that they've seen Jesus deal with that, they're ready to go, and he sends them out. He's essentially saying, don't take it personally. Failure is part of every faithful life. You don't have to stay and be lunch for the mosquitoes. We can leave the beach on the beach, pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and start all over again. Go out of the place that is not hospitable so that we can go and come into another that might be. And so they went out. Never underestimate the power of that. They did it. Jesus sent them out, but he gave them no GPS coordinates, and he didn't tell them which road to take. Now they're no longer with Jesus, and they couldn't have known it, but he did not send them out on their own. Jesus was with them. And Jesus gave them a little something for the journey. Astonishingly, that little something was a share his power, his authority over unclean spirits. Which meant they did things that only Jesus could have made possible, casting out many demons and curing the sick. And that may sound odd to our empirical ears, but don't let it get in the way. They are sent out into a world that is less than hospitable. And the possibility of arrest and death have been their companions since the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Lest we forget the increasing danger that's happening in this story, that little gap in the text between the end and verse 30, in that sandwich in the Gospel of Mark is the execution of John the Baptist. The disciples who follow are now apostles who are sent. They did a bold thing going out. And you know what? It worked. We have to celebrate that in the Gospel of Mark. Not much works. And there's both joy and, let's be honest, relief in their coming back home to Jesus. We spent almost every summer of my life on Captiva. What a privilege as a child. Endless summers on the beach. But I remember particularly the one I shared today because on the evening of July 20th, we gathered around the TV with rabbit ears to witness the men we sent out stepping out onto the moon. 
And then, with a kind of universal exhale of marvel and relief, we celebrated their coming home. A reminder of the beauty of the earth. A parable of daring to go forth, determination to support a mission, and willingness to be sent on that mission. And I would say over the last year, most of us have discovered a new kind of determination we didn't know we had. And a new appreciation for going out and coming in. Going out into the world, and now coming in to the arms of our children and our parents and our grandparents and our friends. We've rediscovered the joy of welcoming one another, our coming in, our coming into one another's company to worship together, of opening our hearts to God's word of inspiration, God's word of sending, and then encouraging one another so that we can go out and share God's healing work in the world. I think many of us have discovered that we have daring faith because Jesus sends us out to unknown places that may surprise us, filling us with awe, to undesirable places that turn out to be just awful, and to familiar places, believe me, places that have become all too familiar, but they still cry out to be renewed. No matter, Jesus sends us out. And he sends us out with something for the journey. The power of God's healing word of grace. And going out, we're not so different from the disciples. We've got to get our gear. What do we need to take? Do we have what it takes? Jesus sent the 12 out to be heard. Jesus sent the 12 out to offer God's healing touch. On their own, they could never, ever have done it. But Jesus sent out the 12, two by two, not alone. And he went with them, giving them the sacred power to do what he sent them to do. We are not so different from the disciples. We go out into a world that is still gripped by unclean spirits, like hard-heartedness, self-righteousness, and its evil cousin, complacency. We go out into a world that is still struggling with demons, like despair and suspicion and cynicism and fear. And we go out into a world that is shocked by what Jesus sends sends us out to be, to say and to do. We are not the first generation to dismiss good news as fake news. The psalmist said the nations are in an uproar. We go out into a world that is in very deep crisis about authority. Everyone is one internet search away from being an expert and authority on anything. And being suspicious of truth has become a kind of macabre national pastime. Words that wound are cheap and abundant, and words of healing and grace are more precious than rubies. Some not fake good news in this story is that Jesus does not call saints to be disciples. Jesus called fishermen and tax collectors to become followers, disciples, to be with him, to learn from him, to grow under his teaching, to depend on him for help, and to serve him the best they could. To be pilgrims on a closer walk with him on uncharted pathways. Over and over, they fail. But Jesus keeps them going because Jesus keeps going out with them. And so it is for us. God is in our midst. We go out into the world, I promise you, with all that we need. The Lord of hosts is with us as we go into the world. And so let us pray that God grants us the wisdom to bring healing to the sick. 
Let us pray that God will bless us with that rare thing these days called empathy, oil for the wounds of the suffering. And I will tell you, we can trust that God will use every faithful gift that we have, like music. Thank you. Balm for the soul. We will meet resistance and even rejection. We will not always be welcomed with open arms, and not every door will be open to us. And still Jesus sends us. But what this story tells us is Jesus meets that rejection and resistance with us. And we can fall into his arms that are open as wide as the sky for us. And Jesus has gone to the very depths of hell and opened the doors of heaven to prepare a way for us. The ones who were sent out returned to gather with Jesus and to share the good news of the work they had done with his help. That was hard to do because the crowds were gathering around them. Their work was following them home. And we don't know who all these people were who were coming and going, but clearly the disciples got the word out. And yet Jesus called them away, called them to rest with him, to rest after their labors. It was a brief calm before the storm of what would come next. It was a time of refuge with the Lord to renew their strength. So Jesus calls us to follow, and Jesus sends us out on a daring mission. Daring because it's a mission of healing and mercy and hope. And then Jesus welcomes us home, offering us refuge and rest. In other words, Jesus is with us in all of our coming and going. Friends, God keeps our going out and our coming in. And from the first day we draw our first breath, God is with us all the days of our lives. And when we give our last breath back, God welcomes us in our coming home. And in between, with the breath of each dawn, God bears us up. Because we live with risk and we live with hope. And God sends us out to share that good news of grace. Amen. <laughs>